Here is a stem from the Pitcairn Islands, a location that has had an important relationship with stamp collectors and one that I look forward to exploring. It's a bicolor stamp with a pink carmine frame that includes two portraits. King George VI is in the top left looking right and the other portrait in the bottom right is of John Adams in which his house is depicted in the black interior artwork of the stamp. This imagery is labeled within the frame at the bottom of the stamp. The face value is one and a half pence of the New Zealand pound and this is a used stamp as we can see by the postmark. There are enough letters on the stamp to make out Island of Pitcairn Island, but there are no numbers present on the stamp that could help us identify a date. This stamp is part of the first set of stamps issued by the Pitcairn Islands in 1940, and it measures 40 by 27 millimeters. You have to be impressed. Take a look at this image again. When it comes to line engraving, recess printing, how they make those trees in the background look far away compared to the rest of the image, that is just amazing, creating such depth in a small postage stamp. It really is quality art right there. The printers were Waterloo and Sons, so it's no real surprise that the engraving is such great quality. But I'm not exactly sure who the artist is of the original image. I found it in an 1853 book about the Pitcairn Islands, an identical image in a book that was printed 87 years before the stamp. And with that said, the book also has this exact illustrated portrait of John Adams. Now, this John Adams is not the same US President John Adams that some of you will be thinking of, although he could totally pass for it. And John Adams was president in the US while this John Adams was living on Pitcairn Island. We'll get to who exactly this John Adams is in just a moment, but I'm excited about this episode because there's a few key things about the Pitcairn Islands that we totally need to explore. Firstly, as a stamp collector, I know that stamps have played a major role in the recent economic history of the Pitcairn Islands. And of course, I know about the famous HMS Bounty and its mutiny, an incredible story of how people ended up inhabiting the islands in 1789, a story that many of you will be familiar with thanks to the 1932 novel Mutiny on the Bounty by Charles Nordoff and James Norman Hall, and the many stage and screen adaptions of this novel and story over the years. Anyway, I have a few stamps and covers to help us learn about these fascinating islands. So if you have Pitcairn Island stamps, get them out now. Let's explore them together. islands are located right here in the Pacific. Four islands with the main and only inhabited one being Pitcairn. And they are extremely remote islands. Actually, some of the most remote islands if you were to consider the distance away from major continents. Both Chile and New Zealand are each over 5,000 kilometers away. They were first discovered by the British in 1767, and these islands were named after the sailor that first sighted the land. However, the British expedition that found it incorrectly plotted the coordinates, making the Pitcairn Islands location wrong on the map. This would become a very important part of the island's story. Now, fast forward to 1787 with the HMS Bounty, or His Majesty's Armed Vessel Bounty. This ship was captained by William Bly on an expedition to travel to Tahiti and pick up some breadfruit plants to take to the Caribbean and cultivate as a source of cheap food to feed slaves. So that was it. Go to Tahiti, pick up some plants, take them to the Caribbean. That's the mission. The bounty set sail in December of 1787 and attempted to get to Tahiti by going west but adverse weather prevented the ship from allowing this to happen. And after a month of trying to sail around Cape Horn, they changed course and sailed around the southern tip of Africa instead. After crossing the Indian Ocean, eventually they reached Tahiti in October of 1788. That's like 10 months in a tiny boat. And the captain, William Bly, 
ran a tight ship and was abusive to his crew, or so the story goes, making conditions overly harsh for the sailors during those 10 months. Now, the details are debated today, but William Bly has been portrayed in literature and on screen as a harsh and unforgiving captain that had no empathy for his beaten and tired crew. As can be seen in the 1980s version portrayed by Anthony Hopkins, and the epic three-hour version from 1962 with Trevor Howard, or the super classic 1935 version featuring Charles Lawton. By the way, they're totally worth a watch if you haven't already seen them. Each are excellent in their own way, and some more accurate than others, but I'll put those links in the video description, as well as links to other YouTube videos and documentaries that help to tell the full story, because I'm just giving you the two, three minute version here. At some point, I'll need to start talking about postage stamps. But anyway, let's get back to it. So after arriving from a difficult and tiring journey, the crew had to wait five months on the beautiful tropical island of Tahiti for the breadfruit plants to be ready for transportation. And as you can imagine, the crew wasn't exactly excited to get back on the ship with an abusive captain and a long journey ahead as well as saying goodbye to the beautiful paradise of Tahiti. This is now in 1789, and not long into the journey, the mutiny took place, led by Lieutenant Fletcher Christian, who was portrayed on screen by Mel Gibson, Marlon Brando, and Clark Gable. Now, Fletcher Christian kicked the captain and his loyalists off the ship, placing them in an open boat with a few days worth of food and a compass, leaving Captain Blyer and his men likely to die at sea. Long story short, Fletcher Christian and his mutineers eventually returned to Tahiti. But then Christian and eight other mutineers picked up some additional men, as well as women and a child, and set sail to continue a search for a place to hide from the Royal Navy. Mutiny was a crime punishable by death, so they couldn't return to their homes in Britain. Instead, they came across the Pitcairn Islands, which they noticed were incorrectly charted on the map. And if it was wrong on their map, then it was wrong on all British maps, a perfect place to hide. This is how the Pitcairn Islands came to be. In 1790, a crew of mutineers along with Tahitians settled down on the uninhabited Pitcairn Island. They then set fire to and sank the bounty so that they couldn't be seen by passing ships and began to live out the rest of their lives stranded on Pitcairn Island. Oh, and side note, Captain Bly eventually made his way safely to Timor in that tiny boat, an impressive part of the story. He continued his naval career fighting in Napoleonic battles before eventually taking a role as the governor of New South Wales before being involved in another mutiny or rebellion, but that's unimportant to this episode. The Pitcairn Islands were not discovered again until an American ship stopped at the island some 19 years later in 1808. And then six years later, a Royal Navy ship stopped at the island, noting that only one of the mutineers was still alive and living there. All of the other mutineers, as well as the Tahitian men that came to the island, had already died in what was a series of troubling and gruesome events and killings. But this last mutineer, John Adams, lived with the remaining Tahitian women, as well as the children, that were descendants of the mutineers. This is the John Adams from the postage stamp that we pulled from the box. He is a loved historical figure for Pitcairn, as he taught the island religion and how to read from the HMS Bounty's Bible. He managed to provide stability to an island that had no other support after all the other men had perished. Today, Pitcairn Island does have people living on it, 47 according to the 2021 census, many of which are direct descendants of the mutineers. The island became a British colony in 1838 and is still today a British overseas territory that has a strong relationship with New Zealand, of which they use the New Zealand dollar as their currency. Right, so postal history. The Pitcairn Islands didn't really have a postal service until the mid 20th century. Well, at first, letters sent from the islands were picked up by passing ships and were hand-stamped, posted on Pitcairn Island, no stamps available. They would then receive stamps and cancellations at ports along the way. These are worth quite a bit of money on the market today, as I found out. Some of the mail at one point was handled by the Canal Zone, and in 1921, the UK and New Zealand set up a system that allowed the islanders to send mail, with the recipients paying for the postage. This only lasted for five years because in 1927, a postal agency was set up that used New Zealand stamps. These were canceled Pitcairn New Zealand Postal Agency. And there's some really interesting covers from this time, including some commemorative covers that are highly sought after. 
This is my earliest piece of Pitcairn postal history, a cover sent from the island in March of 1938. A philatelic cover, of course, as we can see that this particular one was arranged by a stamp shop in Rhode Island. A much less remote island compared to Pitcairn Island, but it's using a New Zealand stamp, the classic 1936 Kiwi one penny definitive, and it was cancelled on Pitcairn Island by this New Zealand postal agency. As you can see by the cachet, this cover is celebrating the establishment of radio communication for the island. Quite a big deal at the time, as it only had radio communications with nearby ships up until this point. But this new shortwave radio allowed the island to communicate with almost any country around the world. Now, this arrangement with New Zealand came to an end in 1940 because the Pitcairn Islands issued their first set of stamps and this includes the John Adams stamp that we pulled from the box. So let's take a closer look at the set. Ranging from a halfpenny or half pence to two shilling six pence, these colorful stamps celebrate the island and its history with illustrations of its scenic bounty bay, the island from afar, fruit that grows on the island, a map of where Pitcairn is, and of course the bounty ship itself alongside Captain William Bly who never made it to the island but was the captain of the ship prior to the mutiny. And as you can imagine, the bounty and Captain Bly will have a reoccurring appearance on the island's postage stamps. But the interesting and perhaps controversial thing to point out about these stamps is the fact that mutineers are present on a stamp with the king. Mutineers who if caught would have been hanged. And several were actually, the ones that didn't travel with Fletcher Christian to Pitcairn Island and stayed in Tahiti, they were eventually caught and several were sentenced to their death in the UK. These mutineers along with Fletcher Christian are from a 1790 painting where they are taking his majesty's ship from the Royal Navy. Now they're on a stamp with his majesty taking a ship from the Royal Navy. Wanted criminals, honored alongside the monarch. Controversial and unique. Now, the same can be said for John Adams on the stamp. Yes, he was a mutineer, but was eventually granted amnesty or pardoned for his role in the mutiny after being found and visited by the British in 1814. The reason for issuing these stamps, beautiful postage for an island with such a small population, was to generate money. Just three years earlier, the British consul in Tonga was sent to Pitcairn to help identify a way of becoming more self-sufficient. And their solution was to issue postage stamps. And it worked. Philatelists went crazy for Pitcairn. The first day covers for these stamps were sold out within a day. And since they ran out of envelopes and paper, apparently covers were being created from parts of coconut trees. I don't have a first day cover with the stamps, but instead a 1944 cover, four years later with a bounty cachet. The stamps remained popular for some time and were available for sale for 17 years until 1957. With the release of these stamps, the Pitcairn Islands generated thousands of dollars within just a few months. So much so that the islands were able to become self-sufficient, generating enough funds to build a post office and a school along with hiring a teacher and the postage income would eventually account for two-thirds of the island's revenue. This stamp was a later addition to the initial set of stamps, an eight-pence stamp featuring the school that was built, a proud product of philately. At the same time, in 1951, another stamp was issued featuring the Bounty Bible. This is the Bible from the actual Bounty ship that was used by John Adams to educate and preach to the islanders. A stamp later showing the Bible along with John Adams was issued in 1957, this time of course with Queen Elizabeth II as the monarch's portrait. Stamp collectors love Pitcairn. It's on the far side of the world, so it's remote, exotic, impossible to get to. And of course it has an origin story that is epic and unique, perfect for telling on postage stamps. You can see this history and epic story of a mutiny at sea, a story being told on Pitcairn stamps as we have seen perfectly with this first real issue, through several others as well. This stamp commemorates the 150th anniversary of Captain Bly's death in 1967, featuring his tomb that is located in London. Also, 1967 was the bicentenary of the discovery of the Pitcairn Islands. So again, we can see a set that tells that story. And while we're talking about 1967, Another interesting thing took place that is worth pointing out. New Zealand switched currency from their pound 
to the dollar. New Zealand's decimalization took place that year. As up until this point, Pitkin had been using the New Zealand pound. So this decimalization impacted their postage stamps. And so a set that was originally issued in 1964, one of my favorite set of stamps from the island, was reissued with an overprint marking to obliterate the old postage value and provide the new one in cents. A very cool set to look out for. So this one, for example, went from two pennies of the New Zealand pound to two cents of the New Zealand dollar. And the old currency was obliterated with this gold anchor. These are very cool sets of stamps to look out for. One of the reasons why I bring up these particular postage stamps is because of a cover that I found that I really want to share with you. This is a last day, first day cover. And I really haven't seen one of these before. The cover has four stamps on it, but from the two sets of stamps that we discussed. The first two stamps to look at are at the bottom here. This is the old currency, a total of two and a half pennies of the old New Zealand pound. And these were canceled on the last day that the currency was in use. July 9th of 1967 and have a last day of issue cachet, which I guess is obvious. I mean, I've never thought of it. We're familiar with first day covers, covers that bear stamps on their first day of issue with a special postmark. Here is a cover with stamps on their last day of issue, a last day cover. We can see July 9th on the postmark, but I'm not quite sure about July 13th. Maybe you had until the end of the week to use them. July 13th was a Saturday. But July 9th was the last day that the New Zealand pound was used. And as you already know, this is not just a last day cover, but it is a first day cover. So on the very next day, July 10th, the new postage stamps were in use, as was the New Zealand dollar. We can see one and a half cents being used with a one cent bounty ship in this case. And I guess it's a bit of a mystery as well with the rate for postage, because I thought it was one pound equaling two dollars for the conversion. Here it's one and a half cents. But just the day before, it was two and a half pennies of the old New Zealand pound. So I'm not entirely sure about everything with this cover, although there's no address on this. So this wasn't going anywhere. It was just a cover collecting stamps and postmarks. But of course, just like my other cover that I showed with the first postage stamps, this includes a beautiful cachet with the famous bounty ship approaching Pitcairn Island. And so how about that? A last day, first day cover where it's all the same stamps, but they had their last day before their first day because their first day came after their last day. Other interesting moments in Pitcairn's history have also been captured on stamps, such as the evacuation of the island to Norfolk Island in 1856 due to the population overgrowing the island's ability to sustain it. All 163 residents left the island, but ultimately over eight years, 43 of them returned to Pitcairn Island. The island had actually evacuated before to Tahiti, but due to exposure to new diseases and just not fitting in with the new culture and lifestyle that the Tahitians had embraced over the years, the residents of Pitcairn had returned. I must point out with the discussion of mutineers settling on the islands, they weren't the first to visit or even inhabit the islands. A Portuguese explorer named Pedro Fernandes de Quieros first saw the islands in 1606. And prior to that, Polynesians built a trading society on the islands that existed for many centuries, but had disappeared, leaving the islands uninhabited by the time Europeans first laid eyes on them. This history was portrayed on a set of stamps in 2007, as we can see with this special first day cover, showing the several tools and markings that have been found and still can be seen on the island. While watching many videos for this episode, I was happy to spot these stamps being used on a sign nearby the rock carvings that can be seen. And I'll link to that in the video description. Definitely worth a watch if you want to see what the Pitcairn Islands look like today. These 2007 stamps are called Early Civilization Part 2, featuring the rock carvers of Pitcairn Islands. There was a Part 1 as well, of course, issued in 2006, featuring the cave dwellers of Henderson Island, one of the other Pitcairn Islands. Both Part 1 and Part 2 are beautiful sets of stamps that look very similar to the Vanuatu stamps issued in 2005, featuring the Lapita people and culture. 
The Pitcairn Islands did something that I wish other islands or small nations that tried to generate revenue from Philatelist did. They mostly issued stamps featuring the culture and history of the islands. Yes, they have several stamps featuring the royal family and their connection to the British crown, as there were also several omnibus issues that they took part in, but they appear to have avoided the temptation to put any subject matter on stamps to try and lure all the collectors to come buy something from them. Well, I mean, there were a few exceptions. The 50th anniversary of JFK's death and the first anniversary of Nelson Mandela's death may not have been directly connected with the islands, but those are in the later years and I suppose it's forgivable because Pitkin also kept the number of stamp issues down. Usually they kept it to six commemoratives a year with new definitives every five years. They didn't overdo it. It was manageable and meaningful. Several of the issues were well thought out and Philatelis appreciated and still enjoy building an achievable collection that portrays a fascinating part of the world with its unique history. Sadly, the Pitkin Islands went bankrupt in 2004 with the decline in letter writing and the sale of postage stamps. The United Kingdom took over 90% of the island's budget, but the Philatelic Bureau remained in operation until 2020. It has since been taken over by the United Kingdom. I went online and placed an order for new stamps on a recent cover. It appears to be Tower Mint, a London-based mint that was appointed as the representative mint for the Pitcairn Islands government, and they seem to print all their stamps. At the time of this filming, it's been five weeks and I'm still yet to receive the cover. I mean, maybe they're just simulating the length of time a cover would take to come from a very remote island. Uh, I don't know. And perhaps this is the end of the Great Pitcairn Stamp era because up until this point, this tower mint seems to only be issuing stamps with the emphasis of the royal family. And of course, these are stamps that aren't being sent from the Pitcairn Islands. However, the stamp history and the postal history that the Pitcairn Islands has to offer is rewarding for philatelists and stamp collectors. If you have Pitcairn Island stamps, treasure them. And if you don't, keep a lookout for them. I'm going to put a number of helpful links in the video description for you to check out, including a link to the Pitcairn Islands study group. If you are a Pitcairn Islands collector, definitely consider joining them. But even if you're not a Pitcairn Islands collector, this is a rabbit hole worth getting lost in and exploring through literature, documentaries, cinema, and of course, philately. I'm always excited to see what a postage stamp can teach us and the journey it can take us on. And this one did not disappoint. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did, please hit that like button and subscribe. More videos are to come. As always, thank you for watching and happy exploring.